Hey everybody, we got a great one today, and I don't usually say that, but we, we just do. My guest is David Litt, who has written a, a book. Uh, he has a book out. It's called Democracy in One Book or Less, How It Works, Why It Doesn't, and why fixing it is easier than you think. Now, I don't judge a book by its cover. I judge it by its title. And this title's not great, to be honest. Uh, you know, and I can say that. I'm the guy who wrote Rush Limbaugh is a Big Fat Idiot and Other Observations, and Lies and Lying Liars Who Tell Them a Fair and Balanced Look at the Right. I know a good title, okay? But I knew that David uh, had worked in the Obama White House, and he had been the guy who supervised President Obama's White House correspondence dinner speeches, his monologues, from 2013 on, and they were all great. Obama just killed at all these. And the publisher sent me the book, and I read, it's great. It's great. It, it covers everything that's wrong with our democracy, but it, do, it does it in a way it's really insightful and it's a terrific read. It's funny all the way through. Not like my stuff, like hilarious, but still funny. Anyway, we'll be talking to him in a bit. Just a couple of uh, comments about the week, uh, about the news. Uh, how about that Supreme Court, huh? Uh, the good decisions, two of them, on LGBTQ rights in the workplace. A uh, great decision by Neil Gorsuch, uh, for God's sakes. 6-3. Uh, I do have to say that Alito's dissent was very gay, uh, you know, in my opinion. And this one I took personally. I am a member of the LGBTQ community. I'm half a B. Now, my experience uh, with that joke is that I have to explain it. Uh, B is bisexual, and half of B is, okay? Okay. That's for the folks who thought the ad for Cigarette Aficionado was a real ad, that it was for a real magazine, and, and, the, and who got mad at me. Uh, so, uh, great decision on DACA. Uh, thank God, Robert's again on the right side. Uh, but uh, he won't be on something really awful very soon, I'm sure. Okay, go peeps of business. Uh, one, subscribe. If you subscribe, you'll know when a new one is up. Next week, a great interview, and I mean it, with Melvin Carter, the mayor of St. Paul. It's a great one. Uh, so subscribe. I also uh, wanted to give a shout out to Talking Feds. It's a podcast that Marie Claire calls the second best political podcast out there. I guess I was first. So I was I was just on Talking Feds with Norm Ornstein, David Frum, and uh, the host of, of Talking Feds, of course, Harry Littman. Speaking of which, the Al Franken podcast is starting a new podcast under our umbrella, and the first one is Morning Jew. Uh, Sarah Silverman will be in the uh, Mika spot, and uh, Norm and Frum and Harry Lippman will be regulars along with Ruth Marcus, Michelle Goldberg, and Howard Feynman. Also, uh, Pod Damn America uh, with the Reverend Jeremiah Wright will be coming under our umbrella. So look for those. And now my conversation with David Litt. It's a great one. You know, for a change. Tell me what the role was for Obama's uh, White House correspondence speeches, what your role was. So I started at the White House in 2011. And when I started there, um, John Lovett, who's the host of Pod Save America, one of the co-hosts, he was like the token funny person in the White House. And then he left a couple months after I got there. So in 2012 onward, I was like the, the token funny person kind of by default. The way we did the correspondence dinners was we would curate jokes from all over the place. So I would write a lot of jokes. We would have people who used to work for the president pitch in with jokes. We would have a lot of people from Hollywood and so on. You know, they'd write jokes. And so part of my job was writing. And then part of my job was just taking, you know, 600 or so pitches, essentially, and culling that list down to about 40. And we'd bring that into the president. And then he would 
kind of go through and pick out the ones that he liked. And usually we ended up with about 30, you know, that, that, uh, that finally made the cut. And, and were you in charge of like putting them in order and sequencing them or did you work with the president on that? A little bit of both. You know, usually we would go in and say, here's just a list of jokes. And then I would start to think about how we script them and how we order them. And, you know, uh, like any speech, I'd work with the chief speech writer on that and so on. And the way I would always put it is like, if everything went well with the Correspondence Center, that was a team effort. If it had gone poorly, it would have been my fault. So that's that's sort of they the, always went well. They congratulate. Yeah. They so, went well. so I never got blamed. Were you ever like in a conversation with the president and saying like, no, that works? You know, a little bit. Um, I think <laughs> w- when. Uh, so, oh, my gosh. I would, I'm going to love to see that. Yeah. So so when I the first person I ever <laughs> talked to about speech writing said to me, here's the thing about speech writing. The, the good thing, the exciting thing is you get to write things that people will pay attention to, right? It, you know, if I have an opinion, it doesn't really matter. And if Barack Obama expresses a similar opinion, people actually pay attention to that. But but he said to me, and he, he was a John Kerry speechwriter in the Senate when he was telling me this. He said, at the same time, if you and your boss disagree, by definition, your boss is right. So that is just kind of a, a difference between speechwriting and, and even joke writing, I think, for political figures ends up being a type of speechwriting. And, you know, being in a, a more kind of artistic writing setting. But there was one time I will tell you, there was a um, a time. So I don't know if you remember the charm offensive in 2013. Uh, the, there was this idea that President Obama would spend oh, yeah. more time. Yeah. OK. The charm offensive. He's going to spend more yeah, time. He personally. was spending too much time with the family. Right. And not enough schmoozing uh, right. of Capitol Hill. And if he invited, like, you know, Ted Cruz to a Super Bowl party or something, then suddenly they wouldn't try to shut down the government. It it didn't work. (laughs) Uh, I think we all kind of knew that, you know, we were trying. And and we were still at at the sort of tail end of trying during the correspondence dinner that year. And someone else pitched this joke about the, the what, you know, kind of what I learned about the Senate. And I went through the joke and I was in the Oval with the president. And I said, you know, Mr. President, here's one we, we like. And he said, I don't really get that. And so I said, well, Mr. President, you kind of need to say it. You know, it's about how the Senate is like high school. So you need to say it in like a Valley Girl accent for it to work. And he kind of mm-hmm. he gave me a look that meant let's move on. And instead, uh, what I said was like, Mr. President, you have to say, well, I was talking to Lindsay, who was talking to Ted, who was talking to John, and they were all like talking. And then I looked at President Obama and I had this moment of realizing that I had just done this in the Oval Office, talking to the President of the United States. And President Obama looked at me and he said, huh, yeah, that'd be funny if a comedian did it. And that was the last we ever talked about that joke. Of course, because you went one thing too man far. <laughs> yeah, also he was right, in fairness. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's absolutely right. No, he, you, don't, he, you don't want him trying too hard in that way. One of the things that I think made President Obama very good at telling jokes is that he understood that part of the joke was that he was the president and he was telling the joke. He was playing off of his own persona and he understood, he had the self-awareness to say, okay, this is funny because it relates to what people already think about me. Um, and which in that case, you know, I went, I went too far um, and, uh, and, and he was right. Okay, uh, let's talk about your damn book. It's about our democracy and how it doesn't work. And uh, actually, uh, you have some pretty good ideas on how to how to approach fixing it. Yeah, to me, this is a book about this dynamic that kept coming up when I worked for President Obama. And of course, it's even worse in the Trump era. And it's the fact that on issue after issue, from gun violence climate change, the economy, healthcare, taxes, the American people want one thing from their government. And by the way, the experts tend to agree with the American people. So this is not about the populists versus the elitists. The, the, the people and the experts agree, and yet government keeps doing something else. In many cases, government is doing the opposite of what we ask for. And yet we live in a democracy. And I just remember thinking, and this was particularly acute as President Trump was being sworn in, How would you explain this kind of a democracy to someone from Mars or someone from Belgium? And this book is my attempt to do that, to figure out how our system of government actually works and why 
our representative democracy doesn't seem to be representing us very well. And then how we fix that, how we restore a government that fundamentally cares about the consent of the governed in a way that ours currently doesn't. Now that, to me, if I'm listening, I'm going like, oh, I don't want to hear that one again. But what I love about this is you take it, boom, 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 one by one. First you go to voting. And uh, I just want to start with that because the way you put it is so uh, eye-opening. You start with this idiot voter who fills out his ballot in a crazy way, not following directions. And this is for the House of Delegates in Virginia. And the Democrat wins by one vote. But these judges look at this guy's ballot and decide it is a vote. And he voted, they decide, for the Republican. And so it's a tie. It's a tie. And they decide with a coin flip, and the Republican wins. And because of that, the entire House of Delegates becomes Republican by one delegate. Okay? Then the next idea you express is that isn't very common. How often are elections decided by one vote. And so you point to the calculus of a voter thinking like, hmm, what are the chances of my vote making the difference? Almost zero. And if that person is going to wait four hours in a line and has to get out of their job, has child care, they're going to go like, this is just too big a pain in the ass. I'm not going to do it. And that person may have had waited in line four hours the last election and gone through that, but this time saying, you know what, I'm not going to do that again. And I think that was a revelation, which is, oh, yeah, that's how they do it. That's how they suppress votes. They just make it harder, especially for people of color, for very poor people, who vote for Democrats? Let's just make it harder for them. And you go through how they do it. And that's why I'm, I just want to uh, recommend this book to my listeners, because your first description of it is something that I think a lot of people try to do, or some version of that. But you do it extremely effectively and, and, and make points all along that other people don't make. So I'm giving you a big, I'm blowing a lot of smoke up your butt. Yeah, I'm, I'm appreciating it here at home. Okay, I'm going to ask you about this because you talk about the four hours in line and then you went to Disney World. Tell us about that and you waited in line for four hours. T tell us about that. So I went back to the, the 2012 elections were a nightmare in terms of line waiting. And, and it, it's worth noting that was not particularly unique. The 2008 elections were actually worse. The, the reason that I focused on 2012 was just that President Obama, in his election night victory speech, brought up the long lines. And then there was a commission that the White House put together to try to do something about it. So the lines were worse in Florida than anywhere else. On election day, people waited on average 38 minutes to vote. And on the early voting period, people were waiting eight hours, nine hours, seven, I mean, just all day to cast a ballot. And I talked to someone who, exactly like you just said, um, you know, waited for four hours and has terrible migraines and standing for four hours in the heat in Florida, he had to leave the line. He, he went into, you know, got in his car, tried to make it home, ended up in a Starbucks bathroom, you know, puking his guts out, all because he was trying to vote. And so people compared it at the time to waiting in line at Disney World. So I figured, well, I have to go to Disney World. Clearly, if I'm, this is where I need to go to research my book about democracy. And I just tried to wait in as long a line as I possibly could, which ended up being about four hours. But the remarkable thing that I learned is actually not how hard it is to wait in line at, at Disney World. It's how much easier it is these days to wait in line for a thrill ride than it is to wait in line to vote. And it's not just a money thing. It's the all of the just basic details, right? They have fans spaced around the line in Disney. You can go to Home Depot and do this stuff. In my lifetime, it has become really much, much, much more convenient to wait in line for a thrill ride, but it's become much less convenient in order to vote. And the remarkable thing about this, and you alluded to it, is that 
long lines are not an equal problem for everybody. So in that 2012 election, non-white voters were six times more likely to wait an hour or more to vote. And one of the reasons in Florida that the lines were so long was all of this sneaky stuff they did to increase the length of line. So they added in these super long ballot measures. And the way that line management works is if you can just take, you know, if everybody takes two or three minutes longer, it doesn't just add a little bit to the line. It is the difference between an efficient line and a line that goes out the door for hours and hours. So by adding these extra long ballot measures that were full of nonsense and not terribly important, the point wasn't to have people actually vote on them. The point was to get people confused in line as they read them so that the lines would get longer and longer. They were trying to keep people from voting rather than make it possible for people to vote. And it worked. And this is all deliberate. Let, let me ask you about one thing, though, because you, and you just alluded to it, which is there is a science of how to make people stay in line. I mean, Disney World is, is, employs that science uh, very effectively, but there's like a science of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I ended up cutting it from the book to try to keep it a, a book that most people, people like me would want to actually read. But I, I got kind of deep into the queuing theory rabbit hole. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, if that's where you want to take this podcast, I'm, I'm more than happy to, although your listeners probably will be deeply unhappy to, but yeah, we can touch on it a little bit. Let's just touch on some of the terms. I love the terms about uh, what the terms about whether you look at the line and bail right away, or whether you hang in there and then bail. What are those terms? So reneging is <laughs> the official queuing theory term uh, mm -hmm. uh, for everybody who's on the edge of your seat wondering about line queuing theory jargon. Reneging is the act of leaving a line you're already in because it's too long. And balking or balking is the act of not joining a line because you look at it and you say, no way, no thank you. And what's important when it comes to voting is that, first of all, both of those things happen and basically everyone has a point where you would leave. So when you poll Americans and you say, how long would you be willing to wait in line in order to vote? A lot of us say, I'll wait as long as it takes. But that's probably not true. There is a point at which most of us would break, or there's a line length at which most of us would balk rather than renege and say, that line looks too long. And one of the things I found that I, I de definitely did not know before I started writing this book was that if you wait an hour or more to vote in one election, you're not just more likely to leave the line, you're also less likely to show up and try again in the next elections. And that's very key. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is deliberate. And what is the difference between white people and people of color in line? Are there, is there data on that? Yeah. I mean, in the election I described, in 2012, black voters waited on average 23 minutes to cast a ballot on election day. And white voters waited on average 12 minutes. You know, it's one of those things where you look at those numbers and you say, okay, it's not whatever. But then you really think about it. So this is nearly 50 years after the Voting Rights Act. Black voters have to wait nearly twice as long, basically twice as long, to exercise their basic democratic rights as white voters. And like you keep saying, that's not an accident. That, that is happening because people understand that if we make it more difficult for one group of voters to vote than for another group of voters to vote, we won't have to convince those people as much. We can pass policies that hurt them because they can't hold us accountable. It's that mech, that accountability that's at the heart of a democracy. And when that breaks down, the rest of it starts to break down also. And, and this is just one little item in here. And I'm going to ask you about all these. One of them, of course, is gerrymandering. Or I guess you're saying gerrymandering because the guy's name was Gary, not Jerry. Is that right? G-E-R-R. -R. And as you say, only Reagan did it right. He called it gerrymandering sounds almost spot on. Um, I have the YouTube clip. The most I've ever appreciated Ronald Reagan was in the what he was saying about gerrymandering. And the other important thing about his view of, we'll just call it the normal, the normal way, gerrymandering, is that he was against it. And Newt Gingrich was against it until pretty recently. So it's only been a fairly recent development that gerrymandering is a partisan issue. It used to be you know, politicians on both sides of the aisle would talk about how they didn't like it, often in a self-serving way, but it was not a partisan issue. And so many of these things 
are becoming basic functional democracy issues are becoming partisan, which is not good, but also not at all surprising, sadly. So basically, I mean, what gerrymandering does is draw lines so you get all the Democrats <laughs> in, in districts. This is for Congress, for the House, and also for state legislatures. Basically, you create districts where it's 90-10 Democratic, and then in other districts, they construct districts that are 60-40 Republican. That's sort of the basic idea, right? That's exactly right. So the technical term would be a vote sink. What you want to do if you're trying to gerrymander an area is stuff as many voters as possible from your opponent into one district so that they win that district every time but by a whole lot. And what that essentially does is lead to what we call wasted votes, right? So, for example, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Jerry Nadler. Yeah, Jerry Nadler. Jerry Nadler's district is bright, bright, bright blue or deep blue or whatever, however you want to describe this color blue. It's very blue. Deep. Deep blue. And what that means is when someone goes and votes for Congress, it isn't doing very much to build a, w a winning coalition, if you think about it that way, that the odds of their vote being that decisive vote are substantially smaller than someone in a swing congressional district. Now, partly that's because of gerrymandering. It's also partly because Democrats increasingly live in clustered together in cities. So it's also true that if you take 86th Street on the west side where I grew up, and draw a circle, you can't find a district. You can't draw a, a district that isn't deep blue. So it's these two things working together where Democrats have increasingly moved to cities or, or being found in cities. And then on top of that, you have Republican state legislatures who won big in 2010, very aggressively gerrymandering this map, which is now more easy to gerrymander. It's easier to draw these vote sinks than ever before. And just to, to wrap that up, the reason those vote sinks are helpful is because then you draw what you just described, the 60-40 district. So those are a little bit closer. Your voters have more power than they do in an in a uncompetitive vote sink, but they're still just outside the reach of even a, a big blue wave, or, or if you were gerrymandering the other way, a, a red wave. And that way of doing it, we focus a lot on what that means for our lawmakers, but I also tried to focus on what that means for, uh, for voters. If you're casting your vote, you want your vote to matter. One of the reasons people don't vote is because they don't think their vote matters. And so gerrymandering is taking your power to pick your representative away from you. It's not just about who represents us. It's also about how much power you have as an American. Uh, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. When you look at the number of House members that they elect to the Republican side and what the popular, if you just add up all the votes... You, you, have, you have numbers on that in the book, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Ohio, for example, again, I'm using the 2012 election because that's one where there's a lot of data, but there's plenty of other examples like this. Ohio, a majority of the, of the voters um, or it was basically 50-50. I believe it was a majority picked Democrats. Maybe it was a tiny, tiny majority picked Republicans. Either way, it was essentially a 50-50 race. It was a swing state in 2012. And yet 12 of the 16 representatives representing Ohio were Republicans. And this kind of thing happens, you know, some similar pattern is there in Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. You had all these states and you had this at the national level where Democrats won the national popular vote for the House. More people picked a Democrat than a Republican in 2012. And yet Republicans held on to their majority by a, very, by a substantial margin. And you had John Boehner election night saying, the voters have returned us to Congress. They want us to continue leading. Well, no, actually, we, the people, said the opposite. We wanted John Boehner to stop leading Congress. But because of the way the districts were drawn, that didn't matter. What we asked for isn't what we got. And that's the pattern that we see again and again. You talk about voter purges. <laughs> and... Uh... You know, the governor of Georgia is now governor of Georgia because he was secretary of state of Georgia and he purged voters. They say that all the time. They're dead people on the rolls. Yeah, when you die, you can't call them. I died. Take me off. So that's not like fraud. <laughs> I, I just, that's one of my favorite things they say. 
It's really remarkable. And I will say, the more I dove into the history of our elections, the more you just see the history of American politics is the history of people falsely claiming fraud in order to try to kick people who are other would otherwise be eligible to vote out of the electorate. This is not new. Um, what is new is just how aggressive things have gotten. And I think that's exactly right. So the the difference between an an untidy registration list and a fraudulent election, people who are not, for example, if someone is dead, as you just said, and they're registered, um, they can't vote. They're not going to vote. And we don't see widespread cases of dead people voting. That's happened, though. It has, it has happened. And w- when we look at election fraud, it also was much more common earlier in America's history. And now the, the type of election fraud that the conservatives claim to be the most worried about, which is in-person election fraud. So not just election fraud, like we saw um, Mark Harris, a Republican, commit in 2018, which was an absentee ballot fraud that his campaign conducted. But right. they're they're worried about me showing up at the polls and saying, oh, actually, you know, I'm some long dead guy and I'm going to vote twice. Or I think Trump literally said, you know, did, did Trump say they like put on, you know, someone like goes and votes, they put on a disguise like a mustache or they hide behind a bush like in a cartoon and then they right. vote a second time. <laughs> and yes, the that's just don't I know you? No, no. <laughs> um, right. We have, weren't you here a second ago? Um, and that's just totally false. I mean, the the odds of uh, an in-person vote, vote being fraudulent are approximately one in 35 million, according to all of the best studies on this. So the, the chances that an in-person case of voter fraud will swing in a presidential election, that is most likely to happen if you just ran the numbers sometime around the year 120 million AD. And by then, voting technology will be very different. What is a much bigger concern isn't people adding votes fraudulently, it's people subtracting votes fraudulently by kicking eligible voters off the rolls. That can absolutely swing an election, and we know that it has, not just way in the distant past, but recently, and even in cases like the 2000 presidential election, which almost certainly would have turned out differently without these voter purges that were way too broad and targeted African-American voters. And that was a presidential election decided by, what, 526? Was that it, or what was it? I, I was going like to say 537, but we're, we're on roughly the same page. Something like that. No, I, I was testing you. Uh, okay, uh, speaking of, of Wyoming, let's talk about the Senate. I, I used to go up to Mike Enzi and John Brasso, the senators from Wyoming, and I'd say to them, you guys shouldn't be here, you know, because there's no one in your damn state. And you guys really shouldn't be here. But the Constitution says every state has two senators. And you write about that, and you actually have a couple solutions. So the the remarkable thing about the Senate, and you alluded to this at the beginning of our conversation, was, you know, we say in America we have one person, one vote. And what we mean by that is that everyone's vote counts equally. So, you know, the same way that, like, if you spend five bucks. And if I spend five bucks, we can buy the same amount of stuff at a store. Our votes should count equally. That is not true in the Senate. In the Senate, Wyoming is, I believe, 168th the size of California. You know, we're talking about the book writing process or the research. I spent a whole day just trying to wrap my head around how tiny Wyoming is, how few people live there. And if you're listening to this and you're from Wyoming, this is not personal. They know it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Look around. There's probably no one no one there. Um, <laughs> if if America was like a two minute, you know, if you, you have a two minute movie and then you just took 12 seconds, that 12 seconds is Wyoming compared to America. It's rounded to the nearest half a percent. Wyoming doesn't exist. And not, neither does Vermont, by the way, because of this, quote unquote, great compromise made at the Constitutional Convention, Wyoming still gets two senators, Vermont still gets two senators, and California, which is massive, gets two senators. And what we see is, for a number of reasons, that ends up really favoring Republicans right now. The biggest reason is, by definition, if your state is home to a really large city, you're an above average state in terms of population. You have more people than average. And because Democrats tend to live in cities, then by definition, the states that are more likely to have a lot of Democrats are also more likely to be underrepresented in the Senate. And so I, I, I have it in the book somewhere, but if you look at the numbers, if you only looked at the states that are weaker than average, in other words, the, the states where your vote counts less 
than it theoretically should if, if votes were allocated based on population like they are in the House. Democrats would currently hold like, I think it's a 57-43 lead in the Senate. It might even be bigger than that. I can find the page at some point. But the point is, the states where voters have less power than they ought to also happen to be the blue states. And there isn't a lot we can do about that because at the Constitutional Convention, the people from the big states, which includes basically like ever, anyone who had a role in Hamilton, right? Like um, Alexander Hamilton was against the Great Compromise. James Madison was against the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise is that uh, every state gets two senators. Exactly. And I and it really bugs me that we call it that because that's how I learned about it in school. But it was not a compromise in the sense of everybody got together and agreed this was a good idea. It was a compromise in the sense of the big states said, it's this or we get nothing because the small states threatened to walk out. And so they basically, Elbridge Gary, actually, of gerrymandering fame, was the one who cast the deciding vote that, that passed the Great Compromise. And even he said, basically, we're being bullied into this. It's the small states that were for that, not the big states. Delaware said, um, if you don't, if the, the large states do not do us justice, uh, we may have to break away from this new America thing and team up with a European power, like a Spain or a France. And so, you know, this was not a small threat. This was right after the Revolutionary War. The idea of bringing European powers back to the continent in that way was, uh, you know, these were fighting words. And so that's why we got this, the, the quote unquote, grape compromise, where we have two senators per state. But it's also the only piece of our constitution that we cannot change even by constitutional amendment. So the only way we could change the way that senators are allocated among the states is to rip up the constitution and start over, which we're not going to do. The best we can hope for there, I think, is to do what we have done in the past, which is strategically admit new states to try to balance things out. Um, D.C. obviously should be a state. Uh, D.C. has more people than Vermont. It has more people than Wyoming. Um, those of us in D.C., we pay more federal taxes than I think 22 other states, despite having very few people. Um, taxation without representation is currently on all our license plates, but it's like that's a very that's cold comfort to have like a slightly sarcastic license plate um, versus having senators <laughs> and representatives. And I also think Puerto Rico should be a state. Now, I think that should be up to the Puerto Rican people. But Mitch McConnell, to give you one example, is very comfortable advocating against statehood for Puerto Rico. And I think we should be willing to say, yeah, Puerto Rico should become a state. It, it seems like it's time. And even that, by the way, would not tilt the balance of power away from Republicans. The Senate would still wildly favor Republicans. It would just favor them a little bit less. In our history, we've divided up states, right? Yeah. So we could make Western Massachusetts a state, or we could make California, what, eight states? We could. I, mean, I, I wanted to write this book you know, and say, well, I'm such a reasonable guy. So one of my reasonable guy ideas was I, I read um, a book called It's Time to Fight Dirty, and he advocates separating California into seven blue states as a way of counteracting the, the imbalance of power in the Senate. And I read about this idea mostly so that I could dismiss it in the book and, and show how even-handed <laughs> I was. Yeah. And then I ran the numbers on it. And if you had California as seven states plus DC plus Puerto Rico, it w still would not favor Democrats. It would even things out. I believe the, the tipping point state in the Senate would then become New Hampshire, which is basically completely even when it comes to its partisan lean. And so that should, I don't think we're going to do that because Californians don't seem eager to split themselves up into seven states, but that should give you a sense of what a small C conservative institution, and in this case, what a large R Republican institution, the Senate is. And it also means that even when Democrats are in control, and you know, this is something that, that you know about as well as anybody, is even when Democrats have 60 votes, that 60th vote is coming from a state that is redder than the country as a whole. Which will get us to the filibuster, and we'll discuss that later. I want to go sort of in, in the order of your book. Campaign finance. Let's go yeah. to campaign finance. Ay, 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 ay. Um, uh, should we go right to Citizens United? You want to go there? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, Th let's this do is, it. This is, I would say, one of the least. I tried to be pretty hopeful. This is not one of the more hopeful parts of the book. That's because of the damn Supreme Court. Okay, Citizens United, uh, again, this is 5-4 vote in the Supreme Court. Anthony Kennedy wrote the decision, and he said, 
basically. This is just allowing people to spend all the money they want on presidential elections. And, and he said a couple things. One, he said, this is great because you'll disclose everything. He said that in the opinion. And secondly, he said, it does not present the appearance of corruption, right? He said that basically removing the guardrails to virtually unlimited campaign spending, and of course the the follow-up decisions to Citizens United then removed even more of those guardrails, will not create either corruption or the appearance of corruption. So in other words, not only was he promising that politicians won't act in a corrupt way because these super wealthy donors now have more power than ever, he was also saying that the rest of us aren't even going to be bothered by it. We're going to be fine with it, which clearly turned out to be false. I mean, by yeah, now, now we know let he me was ask wrong. you about that. Can't you go like, hey, you wrote this opinion and we can prove that what you said ain't true. You said in it, this is not going to create even the appearance of corruption. But if you poll the American people, they think it does. Therefore, that's the appearance of corruption. So go back and reverse this, you schmucks. Something like that. Is that what would be argued in the Supreme Court? <laughs> Uh, I think in exactly those terms. Um, I think the strange thing is that in so many fields, being very confident and being very wrong and not changing your opinion when you're very wrong. Like if you were a surgeon and you kept getting it wrong in this way, uh, people would at some point say, you need to either change what you're doing or you should stop being a surgeon. I think it's not just on the court, but also throughout the, our political process. Being wrong and not being willing to admit you're wrong can oddly be helpful in terms of accumulating power. I mean, we talked, we started off talking about um, the the false fear over voter fraud. Ronald Reagan said that we would have voter fraud if you could register to vote by mail. Mitch McConnell said we would have voter fraud if you could register to vote at the DMV. We didn't, and yet they refuse to recognize that, and that actually ends up being helpful because, of course, what they want is not really connected to voter fraud, and so. I don't know what was going through Anthony Kennedy's head when he wrote that decision, but I think that stubbornness makes it very hard to get people to change their minds. It also makes it, it's not just the appearance of corruption among legislators or governors or the president who might take donor money and then act in a way that gives those donors influence. It also leads to the appearance that the Supreme Court is acting in a way that is much more partisan than it should be because of exactly what you said. The facts have changed and the facts are now very clear that the court got that wrong, and yet the opinions don't change. And, and that's not, un, you know, changing facts doesn't always change opinions. I think we all know that, but it should on, on that level. Well, we have a 5-4 court, and Mitch McConnell appears in your book a lot. And he doesn't come off well. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's, I'd say he probably is, is not the hero of this book. To put it slightly mildly. Yeah, he's, he's uh, sort of the villain in the book, and for good reason. So cynical, this guy. I didn't talk to him much when I was in the Senate because I didn't have much to talk to him about, frankly. He had a good speechwriter, so every once in a while he would do a nonpartisan speech that was a good speech. Huh. So I would go up to him and go like, that was a good speech. <laughs> that would be <laughs> kind of what I'd say to him. And then um, he did a speech at the spouse dinner. There's a spouse club, and they have a dinner every year. And he gave a nice speech. And so I went up to him, and I said, that was a nice speech last night. He said, well, you can't go wrong quoting Mansfield. I just took a little risk here, and I said, you know, I like those speeches better than your evil speeches. And he said, I like the evil ones better. <laughs> and I thought, wow. he's funny. I thought, okay. That's funny. I got to give him credit. That's funny. So then when he gets to be majority leader, I get requests from the press to tell a story about him. Uh, so I figured I, this was a private conversation. That's the story I want to tell. And I figure I better just ask, clear it with him. Okay. You know, so I go up to him on the floor and tell him that. And he goes, well, I guess that's okay. I, I said, well, that, uh, that was funny what you said. And then I talked to him a little bit more, and I realized, no, no. <laughs> it wasn't that he likes the evil ones better. And, and the point of the story was Mitch McConnell has a sense of humor. But then I just 
I couldn't even say that. Uh, he's awful. <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, you know what I want to talk about is the blue slip. And you mentioned this, and you're talking about judges. Mitch McConnell, and it is Mitch McConnell, and it is the Federalist Society, and it's Trump, but it's Mitch McConnell, has ruined the federal judiciary forever. And the blue slip is a perfect, perfect part of this. You want to explain what the blue slip is for the folks listening at home? The blue slip is is a tradition, and the way that it works is it says if you're a senator and a nominee is offered, you know, the president picks a nominee from your home state, regardless of whether you belong to the president's party or not, you need to give your thumbs up in order for that nominee to move forward. You have to turn in your blue slip. And if you don't turn it in, the nominee is not considered. And so that's one of the ways that our political process and, and everything about the Senate, uh, at least in, in my experience, which is less than yours, obviously, but from what I could tell, everything about the Senate doesn't really make that much sense. And this was one of those elements of the Senate kind of grew up as this tradition to protect judicial independence in this roundabout way, because it meant that men, in many cases, nominees had to be approved by a senator from the opposing party to the president. I, they got rid of the blue slip on me because I wouldn't turn on my blue slip on this this uh, nominee for the Eighth Circuit, that Minnesota seat. And I told him I'm not going to hand in my blue slip on this guy. He was on the Federal Society shortlist for the Supreme Court. And and he just, his jurisprudence was jurisprudence I didn't agree with him. He wasn't a terrible person by any means, but uh, I just did not want him. Then what you do, you put a commission together in your state, a committee together, and I say, okay, Republican, you're a Republican president. You get a Republican, but I'm going to put a group together of respected people in Minnesota. They're going to uh, pick somebody or, or a couple, a few choices of people that are really respected and should go on a circuit court. And that's, that's who ended up in the circuit court. So that's why the federal judiciary was respected. Now it's just these federal society, boom, boom, boom. And you write about this. And we've discussed this on this podcast that the Federalist Society uh, just it's it's a pipeline and you have to you have to be a hundred percenter in order to get these nominations. Something I, I left out of the book but I thought was fascinating. I talked to Brian Fallon, who's the executive director of a group called Demand Justice that's trying to push back against this terrible mess that is happening in the courts, which by the way is bad for everybody. I mean the judiciary loses its reputation for nonpartisanship, that's not good for, in the long term, that's just bad for the country. And he, he explained to me what Republicans have done really well is they will launder uh, nominees. So you start off, you're a political hack, and then you get nominated, let's say, to a, a statewide position where no one's really paying attention. And you get nominated to a nonpartisan sounding statewide position, and you get a conservative governor to do that. Then you take that person and you use their new title to get them a spot on a district court where you don't usually have these big fights, the lowest tier of these federal courts. Then once someone's a district judge, you can say, well, look, there was a nearly unanimous vote to put them on the district court. So now they should be a shoe in for the circuit court. And then you move them up in that way. And one of the things that I will say Republicans do very well and have done very well is uh, play the long game. I mean, Mitch McConnell called his, his memoir the long game. and do this over, you know, not just over one presidency, but over a decade, over or more. But it's a way of taking people who start off as completely partisan hacks and turning them into respected or quote unquote respected judges. So it, it is really remarkable how uh, efficient the machine is now to turn political ideology into judicial nominations and, and ultimately into judges. One of the things that I didn't fully appreciate until I started working on the book, and, and your listeners may be more familiar with it than most, but I certainly didn't know it, is that when we talk about new rules in the Senate or norms and precedents and rules, particularly in the Senate, the distinction between those is not always that clear. So what you're saying is exactly right. So when Democrats retake the Senate, which will hopefully be in November, but it'll be at some point. They're not going to bring back blue slips, and then a new precedent is set. And because the Senate runs on precedent, that basically means a new rule has been created. It's the same 
as with the filibuster, where when McConnell said, well, you need 60 votes to pass basically any law, it was technically, he didn't pass a new rule. The Senate rules didn't change. But for all intents and purposes, he created a new rule in the Senate. And then when Trump took over, that was the rule that Democrats went by. And by the way, which makes sense. They, they, there's no reason Democrats should have played by a different set of rules. People don't, I think, remember back, but that wasn't the case before. The, he used the filibuster and you'd have to get 60 for it to go forward. So he was blocking everything. It, it, we had 60 and people say, oh, well, you had 60 for two years. No, we didn't. We had 60 for a few months. We talk about this possibility that the filibuster might allow you to pass legislation. Uh, I've been alive for 33 years. One party has had the ability to pass legislation with the House, a filibuster-proof majority, and the White House for six months of my lifetime. Six months that coincided with you getting to the Senate. I was the 60th vote. I was, I was it. Right. And that is not likely to happen. And, and this is where all this stuff is connected. We were talking about the way that the Senate leans toward Republicans. Well, to get to 60, Democrats have to win a lot of really conservative states. I believe to get to 60, Democrats have to win South Carolina and every state to the left of South Carolina, which includes a lot of very, very conservative states. And that's the easiest path. Republicans could technically get to 60 without winning a single blue state. They would have to win all the swing states and all the red states. So it's not just that the filibuster makes it hard to pass legislation. The filibuster combined with the way that the Senate works makes it much harder for one party to pass legislation than for the other. And that's the reason, by the way, that even though Trump tweeted at Mitch McConnell, get rid of the legislative filibuster, he didn't do it because he knows that it works really well for his party. Well, because they do nothing. Because they do nothing. They, they do nothing, nothing, and then nothing. they can legislate using the judges that they put on the bench. So he did get rid of the filibuster for judges, because now you can have judges pass your policies, and your fingerprints aren't on them. You can have judges essentially pass unpopular policies. Well, in fairness to him, in fairness to Mitch McConnell, we got rid of the filibuster on circuit court and district court judges because... They were blocking these judges for the D.C. Circuit, and it, it was an impossible situation, and I think Harry did the right thing. And you're talking about the filibuster in this in terms of legislation, and you come to the conclusion that we've got to get rid of the filibuster. That, that's exactly right. I started off thinking the filibuster has real value. Uh, certainly when you're not in charge, the filibuster has a lot of value. I mean, it, the Trump era would have been much more devastating if in 2017, for example, the Republicans could have just passed everything on Trump's agenda or, or what passed for Trump's agenda, McConnell's agenda, whatever you want to call it. The filibuster absolutely protected a lot of Americans from some really bad things happening. And what changed my mind was I talked to Sarah Binder, who's a professor at George Washington University, and she's testified before Congress on the filibuster and the history of the filibuster. And I also talked to Marty Paoni, and I don't know if you ever ran into Marty in the Senate. So he spent 30 years in the Senate as kind of the main rules guy for the Senate Democrats. He was the procedure expert. And then he went to the Obama White House, which is where I met him, and he was our legislative affairs guy for the Senate. He is an institution. I mean, literally, when I went and interviewed him for the book, he was wearing a tie that had pictures of different columns on it. Like, this, this is somebody who is an institutionalist through and through. And what Marty pointed out was that once the Republicans, the Mitch McConnell Republicans, once they realize or once they decide that ending the legislative filibuster is going to be in their interest, they'll do it. And so once you know, and I think we can be pretty certain that he's right about this and that this is going to happen, once you know that the legislative filibuster is going away at some point, it's not just a question of if, it's a question of when, then the only real question becomes who's in charge when this new power is given to the majority party in the Senate. Is it going to be a group of people who can use that power responsibly or not? And so I would much rather have Democrats be in charge when the filibuster goes away than wait for Mitch McConnell or some future Mitch McConnell to do it when it benefits Republicans in the Trump mold. And so that's ultimately why I think we should we should do that. It's not because I think there wouldn't be any unintended consequences. It's not because I think it would lead to some kind of utopia. Um, the history of the filibuster is that trying to reform it inevitably creates consequences you didn't expect. 
but I think it's worth the risk at this point. And, and Sarah Binder, the professor from GW, she pointed out, she said, I don't really have a strong opinion over whether legislatures should pass lots of laws, but I do think they should vote on laws. And the filibuster, the remarkable thing about the filibuster is that technically the Senate isn't really voting on stuff anymore, or at least it isn't when, you know, in, in a situation where laws are being filibustered all the time, right? So that, I think, those two things really convinced me that the issue with the filibuster is not how we reform it. It's whether we can convince 50 plus one Democrats that it's time for it to go. Let me ask you what, what reaction you are getting to this in terms of is is any of this getting some kind of oh okay okay mm -hmm. uh, i like this i like this we're going to do some of this so uh, one of the things i will say that i am very very encouraged by is when i started writing this book about three years ago a lot of people i talked to basically said why would you be writing about any of this stuff like no one will really find it that interesting and also there's bigger fish to fry and now as it's coming out i have to say my bigger worry is maybe I was behind the curve, which is a great problem to have. Now, I don't think that's generally true. And I think there's a lot, I hope, that the book has to offer. But the, the reason that I say that is gerrymandering is something that people, not just in political science circles, but throughout politics are talking about, voter suppression. So on all of these issues, I do feel like we are recognizing that like, hey, the rule book got re rewritten when we weren't paying attention. And at least we're paying attention now. I have tried to run some of these things. For example, about the legislative filibuster. I have a lot of friends who have worked in, on, in Congress, who have worked in the Senate. Many of them are kind of more institutionalist in that sense. And so I've I field tested some of these things. And I think there is a sense that whatever we're doing now isn't working and that we're not going to be able to just muddle along. It's not that if we just wait long enough, the demographics change or something changes, and then we get the democracy we deserve. I think people are realizing that the alternative to a well-functioning democracy is going to be authoritarianism. And I think that realization is waking people up. Uh, there's so much that we uh, need to do. And um, thank you for, uh, you know, just pointing those out in this book. And, and again, congratulations. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this has been a really enjoyable conversation. So thank you. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.